say, there it goes. The recording button just came on. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is early on Wednesday morning and it's the elementary school building committee meeting. And I think if I'm looking at, um, we have a quorum by, um, as people know, we're conducting this meeting by Zoom and we'll put the agenda up. And I just wanna make sure it looks like everyone is here. And what I might do is just go around the win the pictures so I can see them to make sure everyone can hear. I'm Kathy Shane and I'm chairing this meeting and I'm going to be reading this in the order that I see the pictures. So Anthony Delaney, just say that you're here or you can hear. Present. Paul Bachman. Uh, Mike Morris. Present. Allison Estes. Present. Steve. Here. Schreiber, Sean Magnano. Present. Dwayne Chamble. Present. E.B. Merriam. Present. Diane Chamberlain. Frozen. She's frozen. Or asleep. Okay. We'll come back. We'll come back to make sure she can hear. Um, Rupert Roy Clark. Yes, I'm here. Uh, Jonathan Salvon. Present. And Ben Harrington. Two of them present. Okay, what I just noticed as I went through it, I knew that before, is no one has the same first name. So I can actually go through and call out first names where we're in a, a not multiple this is and that's. Um, um, this morning, we have um, one person who has to leave. Diane has to leave at eight in the morning. So I'm going to launch right into the agenda. And Paul, if you could pull the agenda up. And because just so people know what the sequence is. And then the next one I want to pull up is the list of milestones. Okay. Uh, so, I, didn't, I thought you were pulling up. The, you were doing the share, share screen. I'll have to look for it. Oh, oh uh, me. Kathy's going to pull them up. Right. Okay. Share screen. And this is the milestones wrong. I put, just pulled up the wrong one. Sorry. This is Kathy being new to and having way to, there's the agenda. Okay, so is everyone is seeing the agenda? Okay, so this is, uh, Mike and I work through an agenda. Some of these are just quick um, notes and he's gonna be walking through it. Um, and um, I'm gonna actually just turn this over to you, Mike, so we can bring up the milestones. But my understanding is we haven't heard back yet on the enrollment report. So the first item doesn't have a report. Is that accurate? So. Mike. Well, anyway, so first item is enrollment report. Then we've got a, a very big overview of a list of milestones and key decisions where we're not putting specific dates on them yet, because as we'll discuss, um, we're dependent on the MSBA taking a step and inviting us into the next step. So the timeline is very much driven by them. And uh, we'll just talk briefly about how often we're gonna be meeting at least for the next few months. We haven't yet set up a website for the committee that would have the whole project up on it, but there is a committee website on the town's homepage. Um, if, and so we can quickly talk how that works if anyone has questions. And then last but not least is trying to agree on dates and when we're meeting in January and February. So let me pull up the other um, screen sharing. Uh, Kathy, uh, yes. Kathy has his hand up. Yes, okay. Oh, I, uh, who is taking minutes? Ah, very good question. Thank you. Do we have a volunteer for minutes? And, and I didn't put it on the agenda. We should probably maybe at the next meeting have a question of how we wanna do minutes, whether we're gonna just rotate it through and get volunteers each time. I think Anthony has been our um, involuntary volunteer each time so far. <laughs> 
So Anthony, maybe if you could do it one more time and I'll make sure that is a topic for the January one on whether we I, rotate it. I foresee I'm getting nominated as secretary next week, but that's fine. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. All right, so I'm gonna um, stop the share on this one and bring up the other um, document and turn this now over to Mike. Sure. Um, well, while you're doing that, Kathy, on just my quick two cents on the enrollment piece, because um, it's on here too, is that there's two factors slowing down the MSBA. The first of, we are, uh, and this happens to us all the time. I don't know if you fall, feel on the townside, Paul, uh, and not to go tangential, we are the first district that's in their new internal computer system of how they spit out enrollment letters and, and everything. So the, there's some technical challenges on the MSBA side that has nothing to do with the outcome. It's just they've, they've transitioned systems. Um, and the second one that's more content-based is just, uh, we've had multiple and I had one a week ago, conversations about how the dual language enrollment Um, um, oh, I'm sorry. I think I was going in and out. I'm going to turn off my video if that's okay, because I think my Wi-Fi is being a little finicky this morning. Okay. Um, so um, we to make a what I was trying to say is that the dual language enrollment process and procedures are really different from a typical enrollment process. Uh, so they're trying to figure out how to calculate that, and so we've given them some additional information. Uh, you know, all pre-existing documents that were presented in public at school committee meetings, but that is another factor in uh, what is taking them a little longer than typical. Um, I don't think, nothing from uh, my sense is that it's a cause for concern, uh, but it is just something that um, when we get the letter, I'll share it with the committee immediately. Um, but those two factors seem to be contributing to a, a little bit slower response from the MSPA. And Mike, Mike, you just might want to explain why that matters, but I think that is what we're on the um, decision making, the milestones. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, so the reason that matters is uh, really the next. This that's a great segue. Thank you, Kathy. So, you know, in terms of module one, our first module, you know, we've submitted everything we needed to submit to MSBA. The town council has voted and appropriated. Sorry about that. The, um, the town council has voted funds for the feasibility study. Uh, there was a, a minor language adjustment that needed to be made that has been done. So really the last thing uh, that we need to do is receive an enrollment letter, which lets the, uh, the community know what enrollment, uh, enrollments we can study. Uh, and then, uh, then we need to go and the MSBA needs to invite the district and the town into the, into the feasibility study. Um, the challenge from a timing perspective is that typically happens at an MSBA board meeting and the board only meets every other month. So it's not like you hand in your last document, sign off your last form and you're immediately in. Um, you, depending on the timing of that, you may have to wait and the next meeting I believe is February 11th or it's in mid-February in any case. So uh, hopefully we'll get the letter and we'll be in good shape to, to move forward at that point. Uh, but that's really the only thing holding us up. Every other check mark is, um, or check box has been checked. Uh, and we're just waiting for the MSBA to get back to us with that enrollment information. There's other questions on that. I could do it, but I thought when Kathy and I spoke, it was just perhaps helpful to, to go in a little more detail to things that might be coming up um, and that at a broader level, you know, for things further down on the list. So people got a sense of the scope of, of the work. Is that okay, Kathy, to yep. dive right in? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and, so... And and, and what I would suggest to people, um, I can't easily open up the gallery view with everybody's face, but if you have a question, um, raise your hand um, so that we can pause and take questions or hold or write them down. I can help monitor that for you, Kathy. Okay, thank you. So as I mentioned, we're waiting to uh, receive the feedback uh, and decision of the MSBA and what enrollments they'll allow us to study. Um, and that'll have to be signed off here locally. Uh, at that point, we can um, hopefully attend, you know, their virtual meeting in February and hopefully get invited in to the feasibility study. Um, so, you know, one of the things to note is every major step along the way involves an MSBA board meeting and MSBA approval to go on to the next step. Uh, this would be, other than when we were first invited into the process, this is the next kind of formal big step. So it happens at the MSBA board level. Uh, and I say that because I think, you know, again, depending on 
when we get a letter of enrollment, when we sign off on it, it may impact things. And because the board meets every other month, as opposed to the local boards here, it, it, it can have an impact on how quickly things get done. Uh, but uh, once we're through that, uh, the next uh, step is to select an owner project manager. This is a pretty labor intensive process. Uh, I know Kathy sent some links so you could dig in a little bit more, but it, it, it's really the last time that the committee, uh, in my experience, feels like they're on their own. Uh, owners project managers do multiple things, but in general, they're additional support for the committee and for the town. Uh, they make sure that any other contractor is hired, they manage all the contracting of that. They also are the people who can say when an architect or a contractor comes in and says, oh, this will cost this much, they're the support for us, right? They're, they're, they're people who are licensed architects who do this work. They manage timelines. They're on top of all the consultants who work for us. Uh, but the hiring of the owner project manager will likely come from a subcommittee of this committee who gets, you know, does a request for proposals, uh, receives those. Anthony will be critical in this stage. Thank you, Anthony, in advance. Sorry, it feels like Anthony's getting tasked with many things, but we appreciate having you, Anthony. Um, the, they, do, they perform interviews, um, they shortlist candidates, um, and then they'll make a recommendation to this, this body, to the full committee, about which owner project manager they would, they're recommending. Uh, and then there's contract negotiations with that that firm, whoever it is that's selected. Um, so while it, it seems, you know, owner project manager is a little less glamorous than hiring a designer and all those things. Uh, my experience is it's a critical step because uh, they're going to be with you the whole way. And they are the only people who truly are a support exclusively for the committee. Um, and so getting that right is important. They also can play a very large role in communication with the larger public. Um, and, and help manage the entire process because I think it, it does become you know, potentially overwhelming uh, as it gets more complex over time. Once that, well, let me stop there and see if there's any questions on the OPM part. I guess I'm not seeing any from Paul or- I have a question. I can't raise my hand um, because I'm a host. Um, so timeline, time-wise, um, when should this committee, so right now it seems like we're waiting to, for the MSBA to meet in mid-February. When do we do the OPM? Do we wait until after mid-February to initiate that process? Yeah, I see Anthony nodding his head and, and uh, you know, Anthony, if you're willing to jump in, he could also answer a little bit more about the posting period, how long it has to be posted and that process takes. Uh, Anthony, do you mind jumping in just from a procure procurement perspective? Um, so uh, yeah, we, uh, we cannot proceed with the request for services with the OPM until um, MSBA uh, in the, invites us to begin searching for one. Uh, there's a, the RFS for the MSBA if, uh, is fairly straightforward. It's already written and there's, it's basically a fill in the blank project. Uh, if you are familiar with the way Fort River uh, conducted their RFQ for an architect, it will not be much like that. It'll be a lot a lot simpler. Uh, MSBA also requires that we submit a redlined version of the RFS before we uh, actually go out. So there will be some back and forth there with them reviewing the document after, we, after we've done our part. Um, then it will need to be uh, posted publicly. Um, We'll receive the responses from firms. We'll interview. We'll review them, interview them, um, and then with the MSBA decide who is actually hired. I'm not sure exactly what kind of uh, Dr. Morris can uh, correct me on time figures, but uh, that process will probably be a, a, a. I would think at least six weeks from posting to actually having someone on board and longer to, uh, and that's not including the time to actually write and review the thing with the MSBA. I, I think I think that's uh, helpful and I think that's a fair estimate. Um, there also is some, some small degree in my experience of contract negotiations with the firm uh, mm -hmm. executing that contract. And I think one thing that Anthony stressed that I probably was remiss not to is that every time we're doing legal documents and we found that it's out even with the, the vote for the feasibility, it has to be approved by MSBA legal. So there's additional steps um, because they are 
a uh, helping fund the project. Anytime, you know, this committee might say, yeah, we're good to go with an RFQ or RFP. Um, there's another approving agent along the way. Um, and so thank you for mentioning that, Anthony, because that, that was a, this is an important detail. And that, that, that continues through the whole process. That's not unique to this aspect of it. Any other questions for me or Anthony on OPM? I guess my only question is, Paul, it's that we can't actually go out um, before we're invited in. And Anthony, when you said it's a fairly easy form to fill out, you know, doing the draft of it internally is then possible, you know, in advance, even though, or do we need something in advance to even begin to do a draft? I'm just looking at, you know, are there any places where we can anticipate and be ready for the next step? I, there's a, we can't do all of it before we're invited, but there's a lot that we can do in advance. And in fact, I've, I've already started on the most obvious blanks to fill in. Um, so if this committee saw fit to appoint a task force of, of people, mostly school personnel to start looking at reviewing and filling in the parts that we can, uh, I think that would be appropriate at this or the next meeting, maybe. Okay. Thank you. That, that was helpful. Hey, I'm trying to scan the room too. I don't see other hands up, Paul, unless you're seeing something that I don't. Okay. So um, that process goes on and then we, we are starting our project team. And, and the, the great thing about having the OPM is they'll have some introductory meetings with the full committee. Uh, they'll talk about their work and they're gonna get a sense from the full committee of how the committee sees the partnership happening, right? Every, every project's different, every committee's different. Uh, and I think that's the thing in my prior experience with OPMs is they're all good, they're all successful. They'll all give a long list of MSVA projects that were successful they were part of. Uh, but it really is about defining what does the group want. So perhaps for a future meeting agenda, uh, having some initial conversation around what are the things that are valued. I know that there probably needs some context uh, that needs to be offered for that conversation, but what are the values that the committee has and what is the committee really looking for that, that, that group to do is gonna be a really critical component. So when there is an interview committee, they go with the charge instead of you know, individual opinions. Um, so um, the next part of the process is, this, is, it's called the designer, but what commonly thought of as the architect selection. Uh, the nice thing again is that you have the OPM to help run parts of that. So Anthony's role uh, finally gets a little smaller <laughs> as it relates to this because the OPM really helps manage uh, that process. Uh, and it, probably the most surprising detail to people about that process is that it actually is that decision is not made by the committee. So the committee appoints three representatives, and I don't think it's any three. I think, as I recall, though I, I did not review it this morning, I apologize. I'm sorry, but I was freezing up for a second. Um, I, you know, it's um, there are three representatives um, that go and sit with the designer selection panel, uh, which is generally 15 people total. So three representatives of the town and the district and 12 representatives of the MSVA um, to uh, interview the finalists, the people who are shortlisted. Um, and you typically in the past, it was in Boston. Hopefully we'll still be in a place where people don't have to drive out, um, not in terms of COVID, but just in terms of convenience. Um, and, um, and that 15 member body generally makes the decision, uh, not generally, does make the decision on the architect that's hired for the project. Um, so, you know, as I remember, there, there is some front end work that the committee can do, um, you know, especially a subcommittee of the committee to look at the applications that came in but as opposed to the owner project manager where a subcommittee of the committee makes a recommendation to this committee, that decision is made and the majority of uh, people voting on the decision for designer are at MSBA. I will say my experience and what I've been told in the past is that there is some deference given to the three members of, the, of this delegation uh, who attend in their voice, but, but not always. There's examples that I know of, of uh, where the, the MSBA component of that group ends up making a different decision than perhaps that three member team would. Uh, there's also obviously a situation where the three member team does, do not agree, right? It's not like there has to be a block voting. It's actually no way to do that. There's no private conversations that can occur. It's all in public. 
Um, but it, but that's a different process than the owner project manager, again, primarily because we don't have to manage it ourselves because we have the OPM, but also because the decision maker is not, not there's no recommendation that comes back to this group. Um, the decisions made, you know, in that designer um, selection panel meeting, uh, which is primarily comprised of, of uh, staff or board members of the MSBA. So, you know, that process, similar to the OPM, you know, it does involve a public register, a, you know, request for proposals or qualifications, a short listing process, right? So it is labor intensive, but the end of that uh, process happens in a meeting at MSBA, um, not native to kind of this group. So I'll pause there and see if there's questions on the architect or designer team selection process. I don't see any. Okay. I don't know if I'm just boring people early in the morning no. or if I'm being thorough. It's well, 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 I have one <laughs> just on timing from the time we select an owner project manager to the process you've just described of architect and design team. Um, rough, you know, what's, what's the month's range of how intense work between step three and step four is there? Is that a couple months? Is that a month? Um, so just, I'm just curious on timeline. Yeah, so uh, Anthony can help me here, but you know, it does have to get posted. Um, you know, typically you want to get the broadest, you want to get the, you want to give a long enough time period where you get the greatest number of applicants. Uh, so, you know, if you put a really short time period, these are huge packets that people, it's not like a, a job application. We might get a cover letter and a letter of reference. Uh, at that point, we have enrollments, we have an owner project manager. These are huge, uh, very frankly, uh, glossy, uh, uh, re re um, documents that we receive from each of the applicants. So there is a reasonable time frame that we have to offer and we want to get the best applicants we can so that we have the best chance of getting the best architect. Um, much like some of the other processes, it's not a board meeting, but the designer selection um, panel at MSBA doesn't meet every week. So it's not just about, oh yeah, we're ready. It's about we're ready. And then three weeks from now is the next meeting. And the, you know, hopefully we can get on the agenda because there's other communities in the same process as we are. Um, so I, it's definitely not a month. It's definitely more than a month. You know, um, I, I, it's, it's, it's a soft estimate. So if I'm wrong, please don't, uh, well, you can just tell me anyway, that's fine. But, you know, I'm thinking two to three month process from when we first get our request for proposals. Um, we receive applications, we shortlist, uh, we then get into a finalist, get scheduled at MSBA, have the MSBA conversation and sign a contract. Three months seems about you know, what I'm thinking about, Anthony, I don't know how you, I, I certainly trust your your instincts more than mine on this, but that, that's just what comes to mind. Uh, that sounds right. It wouldn't, uh, not as familiar with the MSBA process at this stage. So I'm not sure how much, inter how, how much fulfilling the MSBA's requirements add to that time, but I, I think that's a fair estimate. Mike, this is, this is Jonathan. I, I can chime in a little bit if you like. I would love that. that. Uh, I, the MSBA process is very similar to the to other ways the state solicits uh, big public contracts. And given the COVID piece, I think two to three months is probably a, a fair estimate. It might actually be slightly optimistic. Yeah. Um, they're a little. The other agencies are a little behind in the the time it takes them to review uh, applications once they come in. So you know, four months wouldn't surprise me. Let's hope by then we're past COVID and it's two or three months. Okay, thank, thank you, Jonathan. You. Any other questions on that? Uh, no, that was that was helpful. I'm just you know thinking of an elastic calendar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, one of my favorite things about getting the OPN on is they have very fancy ways to you know have calendars that then adjust as Jonathan indicates as things change. Uh, yeah. That yeah. You know, they're good at that, um, or they should be. Whoever hires should be good at that, uh, which is really good for the public facing part as well, not just for the internal piece, but just letting the community know where we are in the process and what to expect. Um, at that point, the feasibility study commences. So what that means is that um, whatever the enrollments that are approved by MSBA get studied. Um, we'll look at things like um, site selection. Um, we do have a tremendous amount of information about two sites in our community. Uh, 
I'll be blunt, I've been through this before. We've already looked at what sites are available at town. I don't think there's any new huge site that's big enough for a school that we're gonna find, but we still will have to go through that process. They will, we'll have to look at GIS mapping of the community, uh, take a look at what sites are available. Um, so there's some connection to the planning department and, and over at the town, uh, town hall to help us with that. Um, we will, the architects and the OPM will start looking at, you know, what are the commitments uh, and desires of the committee in terms of what the building should look like, what the building should feel like. Um, you know, at that point at the feasibility level, it, it's, it, it, you're starting to get a sense of the design, but it is sort of boxes that can be moved still uh, in terms of the classrooms and where it is. You know, one of the things that will come out is, you know, uh, like a typical question would be how much community use do we imagine for the school after hours? Uh, and that'll have implications of the building design in terms of where the building locks and where it doesn't. How do we feel about school safety? Um, obviously everyone cares about school safety, but there's really different levels that people feel. I've been at relatively new schools that are MSBA schools um, that have wildly different feelings as it, as it relates to school safety. Um, they're gonna wanna get a sense of um, you know, players and outdoor areas, because that's gonna affect uh, where the building's located potentially on a site. Uh, they're gonna wanna know, do we have swing space if we decide to kind of add reno and how do we manage that? So those are the types of things that go on you're not gonna see the beautiful 3D imagery uh, of building at a feasibility level, uh, but importantly, they're also gonna get a cost, right? And it, it's, it's a kind of at an estimate level. Um, and they're gonna, we're gonna, you know, like almost every other, you know, school, we're gonna study multiple enrollments. Ours may be a little more complex as it typically is in Amherst. Uh, and at the end of the feasibility study, there's a report that's given that goes to MSBA uh, and it, it shows all the multiple options. And then really there's a huge decision on the, on the committee's part, which is at that point, we have to choose one design configuration to study in depth. In other words, we may be studying a consolidated model and a just replace or renovate Fort River model. And in the feasibility study, we can study both of those or maybe a third one, we'll see what they tell us for enrollment. But uh, when we get beyond feasibility, you know, it's a report that goes to MSBA, there's a multiple meetings with the MSBA, they'll ask a tremendous number of questions of both um, the committee uh, as well as the design team. Uh, and then we have to make a decision about a preferred model. In other words, the next step where we go into study uh, something more depth, we can't do that for more than one model. And so really, you know, and Kathy and I spoke about this, where we get into feasibility, we're going to have some pretty big decisions ahead of us. And, you know, I, I, my idea was to partner, you know, and, and I haven't talked to Ben about this. Uh, I apologize, Ben, to partner with the school committee and the building committee. So we have a, a broad set of public engagement um, along the way, because there's, there's an overlap between the design options, the school committee's thoughts on an educational model. Um, and, and, you know, I think the more we can have a consistent collaborative approach, I think the communication to the community, the broader community, the school community, will be so much better than if we have parallel processes here. So um, Kathy and I talked about that. It's just Kathy and I, you know, it was a two person conversation, but, uh, right. but I think uh, I wanna emphasize that point that once we get to step six, uh, there's a decision, a pretty big decision that's been made. Uh, and we wanna make sure we're doing a lot of engagement in step five so that as, we're, as that process is going on, we're getting real cost estimates, real design looks, uh, that, that there's an interactive opportunity for, for all audiences in our community uh, to be weighing in on their thoughts. Um, when I pause there before I get into the uh, kind of the, the next phase beyond feasibility, once we get into, um, yeah, when I pause. Kathy has her hand up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I tried to do it both ways. Um, you know, the, the um, outreach to the community, both to let them know uh, as information starts to be generated. Um, I, I looked at a couple other town websites, you know, and I know Paul, you said the, and Mike, you said the project manager will help us manage a website at one point when the project is fleshed out. And a few of them were fairly interesting for the way they, set it up interactively to really allow you to go on and click on different things. So I'm thinking that we might, um, and I'm perfectly willing to go out and do a few more of these. And these, were, these weren't specifically on schools, but one was on climate change, one was on housing choices um, that I saw. And it just um, trying to figure out some ways that we can 
um, make it easier, whether it's at the district council level or we've had, you know, to bring things out to where people live, school committees. So, so some thinking of um, methods of, of getting this out is something I think I would like to see. Maybe we have a subcommittee trying to figure out ways to do that with working with the IT people. But I, I, I agree with you. I think it's really important so that uh, there's not this feeling of that there's a black box and suddenly a model appears, but you know, much more people understand that array of choices initially as it gets winnowed down to the one that's in more depth. So I'm, I'm not giving specifics, but I'm just thinking there's probably some ways we can do that um, that might be innovative or creative. Yeah, Paul. Um, Mike, on the model school program, is that still an option for the town or is that something we would not want to look at? So uh, the model school program historically was, uh, they had some uh, designs that were completed in MSBA processes that um, essentially could be mimicked. So if you had a similar size school on a similar size site, um, if you if you join the model school project, it would limit the number of modifications you could make. In other words, you weren't starting from scratch. You were starting from oh, there's a school, I'm going to pick West Springfield, they have a high school, so it's not a, no one can think that I'm cooking the process, but, you know, we like that high school in West Springfield, we're building a similar size high school, we're essentially going to take that model and make some, you know, relatively minor revisions in the overall context of what we think about revisions, and there were some financial incentives. When we were in the process last time, that, that process was on hold, there was no model schools program, uh, and part of that was they just hadn't updated what a model school would be, they were 10 years old and just didn't make a sense anymore. Um, so that's something we can definitely explore as we get into the next phase of MSPA. I know they were trying to revamp and get that going again. Uh, I've actually lost track of it. So I apologize where they are with that. Um, but it is something that uh, can be discussed certainly. Um, I think the challenge that we may face is that um, we have a net zero bylaw. Uh, and I don't mean that's a challenge. I think that's a good thing. Um, but the challenge would be what are the design implications of a net zero building and could we use uh, a model school. And this is like a literal, I don't know question. It's not a, I know the answer to it and I'm speaking in code. Uh, could we use that if, if we have a, a net zero bylaw, which might change some of the design? Because um, I don't believe there's been an MSBA project that sort of mimics uh, some of the, the energy efficiency we would need. And I know the energy efficiency, people think of solar arrays and, and other very uh, tangible, uh, but there's really design implications on envel building envelope and stuff Jonathan and Steve and a bunch of other people here are more qualified than me to speak about. Um, but it, it is something we should probably come back to uh, before we go too deep in. And that, again, that's where having an OPM can go in and knows the answer to those questions has been through it before. And, and you don't have to hear me uh, ramble on about things I'm not that clear about. So um, I'm all for the OPM you know, jumping in and, and that's one of the roles is they can answer questions like that. And just so on the, um, we received, it was actually forwarded to me by a couple different residents of last week, um, MSBA was doing a webinar on the model school program with an example of a school that had significantly cut their costs by going through the model school program. Um, but it was an invitation only, you know, even if we that happened on December 4th. So it was intriguing. You know, people were sending it like, look, this school did the following. So I think it would be worth us at least following where that is. And it, it looked like you had to be invited to the webinar, you know, to be actively thinking about things. So that'll be good to get that on the radar screen, Mike. Yeah, I agree. And, and then the OPM, again, will be the helpful resource on that one because, you know, OPMs have been, they're at MSBA all the time. They have their own sessions with MSBA and on trainings on this stuff. And their job is really to bring it back to the committee and form the committee so the committee can make the best decisions moving forward. And, and I, you know, I want to say publicly, I'm aware of the financial constraints we're all facing in the town of Amherst as well. And I think anything we can do to, to get a high quality product that um, has less tax implications for residents is we have to consider in my personal opinion. Steve has his hand Steve up. has. Yeah, yeah. So um, I miss a webinar also, and I, I, I'm going to try to see if they have a recording of it. But I would definitely approach the model school. I mean, we're we're a long way away from this decision. I would approach it with great caution. This is from the perspective of an architect. So exhibit A might be Fort River and Wildwood, which were probably an example at the time 
of using the same school plan twice. And so what happened there is, I don't know which one was designed. Well, I, I'm sorry, I, don't, I lose the track of which one came first, but then they also, you know, that turned out not to be the ideal uh, project to be building twice. So um, the other thing is I understand on, it's a little bit like if you're designing a house, do you want to go to a plan book, like a book of, and choose a plan out of a catalog, or do you want to, you, you know, design something from scratch? But I, we have a long ways to go, but I can't imagine that there's a site in um, Amherst that's generic enough to be really accommodating of someone else's, you know, plans, but I'm, I'm all ears. Okay, um, I don't see any as I scroll through, I'm trying to see yeah, if I don't any... see any other hands up. Okay, um, so, um, so again, uh, you know, after feasibility, we get into much, we, we have one thing we're studying uh, which will feel good, trust me. Uh, when you get there, it feels good. Um, and, and then you're really getting into much more specifics on the design, right? At that point, you're getting to the place where the boxes can't move anymore. Like you've moved them, you've, you've, you've got them where they are. The music room is going to be where the music room is going to be. The instrumental small group spaces are going to be where they're going to be. Um, I think it's really critical at that point. This is my own personal bias, uh, having been principal at Crocker Farm for five years. Um, that we think through uh, some of the storage and custodial pieces of that too. That is always something that gets shortchanged and having lived in that building. And if Derek Shea was here, he would agree with me. Um, really thinking through where stuff will go, uh, you know, and, and I'm sorry, at the broad conceptual level aren't so important, but then you're really getting into the nitty gritty here. You're starting to see some 3D designs of the building. You're starting to actually see what the building will look like. Uh, you get some fun decisions at that point where you're like, no, actually I like the view from this side better. And uh, I'd like to have, you know, some outdoor learning spaces on this side. And, and so that, you know, for me, you know, is fun. But the challenge of that side is you're getting real with costs. Right at, at the feasibility level, the costs are, are you know, and, and the OPM will explain this better than I can, but or Jonathan or Steve could, you know, the, the, the cost estimates are, are, are broad. And now you're starting to make some real decisions about we want this, but it would cost X to, to do this. Therefore, we don't think we can do it. Uh, what kind of flooring do we want? Huge implications on cost uh, and, and life cycle of a building. You're getting into HVAC systems. Uh, you're getting into, you know, the building operation systems, things that, you know, again, Ben and other people, Rupert are much more equipped to talk about than me. Um, and, and so you're getting into that level of detail because at the end, you're getting to project scope and budget. So that's where you're saying, here's our real cost. Uh, here's an estimate of where we are. And that's where you're bringing it to MSBA at the end of that. And MSBA is saying, yeah, we'll fund X percentage of this cost not to exceed. So, so the, the work at that phase is, you know, you've really, you've got what you're studying, you're getting into real detail. So people like Allison and Diane are saying, no, we can't have the ELL program here because of X, it needs to be more integrated, right? So you're getting into to, to really specific details on, on that. Um, the cost estimators are doing multiple, you know, your multiple cost estimators go through. At the end of that process is, you, you know, you have the guts of a building, you've got the design, uh, it goes to MSBA again, all of these times you're going back to MSBA multiple times, they're asking multiple questions and they vote and they say, yes, we will support this project if the town is willing to finance it. And here's the grant that we will give you. We will pay this much for this building. Um, and at that point, it then goes back to the town to fund the town share. Um, and, and again, when Kathy and I spoke, we, we didn't want to get past this because then you're getting into design, you know, design uh, construction and, and, and a bunch of variables that are way, you know, years out. Um, but, you know, we, we thought, uh, and I appreciate Kathy's leadership on this, that this seemed like the right amount of scoping for today's meeting. So we know sort of the task at hand, you know, I, I do think this is, this is probably two years out from where we're looking at, you know, hopefully sooner, hopefully everything breaks right. But, um, you yeah, know, we can start worrying about 2023 uh, a little bit later <laughs> uh, than, than today's meeting. Uh, but we wanted to scope out at least uh, the types of things that would be upcoming. So people got a sense of the work. Sorry if I was long winded, you know, I was trying to give the right amount of detail. I may have overdone it. I apologize. No, that. no, I, I think that was great. Um, 
I'm just going to look to make to see if there are any other questions because um, um, I, the the segue to this is us thinking about uh, the work we need to get done in January and February. How often we need to meet. Um, and then Diane has dropped off this, but we are posting the videos so everyone knows that same web page that has our minutes on it, and we will be putting things up in packets has the, the video so if you miss any part of it, but um, my understanding of what you just went through, Mike, is it may be once a month meetings in January and February and then maybe by middle of the year getting more intense um, in terms of more often, does that sound? And then there's a selection of a subcommittee that would be helping spec out the, the owner manager. So there's a subgroup that may be meeting more often. So just a sense of our own looking forward on our schedules for January and February, and then when it becomes more intense, any comments on that? I would just say that makes sense to me. Uh, you know, people who do decide at the point to join an OPM subcommittee, it's sort of like a quick, intense burst of work and then it's done. Um, but it is reading many long documents uh, and making sure we're, we're interviewing the right people. And then, you know, the interviews are pretty lengthy as well. But for the full committee, Kathy, I think that uh, from my perspective makes uh, tremendous sense. Okay. And so, you know, so um, we will send out some choices of dates, but for January and February, I was thinking tentatively this we're in the second week of this month that we might peg it that week. Although um, when the school, we were gonna check, make sure when this MSBA meets in February. So we're meeting after, after that. So we're not waiting for another decision from them, but send out dates that people can pencil in their calendars. And the one issue I just wanted to raise, um, I don't know whether we have an easy solution. Diane has a standing meeting that starts at eight in the morning. Um, so everyone was fine with the 7.30 meeting. And when we sent that poll out, um, any day but Wednesday, we lost two to three people. So, so we had uh, we we chose to stay with Wednesdays at seven thirty. And she told me she can't easily move that meeting for the spring. But it may be if the more intense work that where she would want to be part of the meeting doesn't start. So we we can have that conversation again in January. But right now, I think we're set, staying with um, Wednesday at seven thirty and most likely that second week in January, but we'll send out a notice confirming that. Uh, so I think those were the, the big um, issues on you know calendar looking forward so people can put it on. Um, and on January, it sounds like one of the things we wanna do to make sure we have an agenda is this selection of the OPM subcommittee who, who would like to be on that. So we're ready to have that committee think through what they're going to be doing. Does that sound about right for an agenda? Um, since we won't have heard back from OPM, for, from MSBA yet? I think so. I think hopefully at that point, we've heard back from MSBA about the enrollment piece, um, you know, so we can share that as well. Uh, I certainly hope by, by then we, we would have. Um, so that can be an agenda item as well. Um, but th I think both of those would be important ones for the committee. Okay, and what you had mentioned as you quickly went through that in my notes, it was choose that subcommittee, but also have a, dis a group discussion about what values, you know, so we have a, um, something that is guiding that. So that would be a, a full committee discussion, I would think, um, to at least start that. Um, anything anyone else would like to bring up before I turn it up? I want to open it up for public comments to make sure we do that. Paul? Should, should we tentatively pick some dates? Because, you know, in January and in February, I think MSBA meets on February 11th. So if we're meeting on Wednesdays for the next two meetings, we could look at the 17th of February and either the 13th or 20th for January. Okay. That's, that makes sense to me. So um, January 13th would be a Wednesday. And if we wanna make sure we're meeting after MSBA, it would be February 17th. 
and that those would be Wednesday at 730. Okay, everyone. Okay. You know, and I will do what I did this time is send out the agenda and any materials. And if, if you look at the way for school committee, we're doing the packets a little bit differently than when you're used to for schools that, you know, there is a specific agenda and each item that we are discussing will be in the packet as a separate item. So as we go forward, you know, if um, people are sending in a report or if anyone wants to download some of these modules, we've also, the other discussion we need to have, um, and I don't want to take people's time now, is minutes, how we want to um, review minutes. And I'll put that on the agenda for next time. Um, there are draft minutes from both of our previous meetings and they have now been posted. They're in, I believe, this week's. So, um, so for now, if people are willing to, if you take a look at those minutes and just send any comments you have in on them, we can make the minutes be part of the discussion in January so we can approve them. And we can, um, one way we've done it in some committees is have be one group, one person be an approver of minutes so that we don't have to take time on a meeting agenda to have a, a nine person group reading them. But um, for now, if you just send in comments to me, if you see anything in the minutes, then we'll have, um, if there were any changes, we can vote on final minutes. So I think if I don't see anything else, I don't see any of our hands, I'd like to open it up for um, and the public. Um, we have, um, one hand up in the public, and Paul, you said you know how to bring in people. Well, you are the host. I can't. So, um, Bruce, I think Paul is bringing you in. I'll stop the share of the screen so we can go back. Um, Bruce called him. If you would tell us who you are, where you live. And uh, the floor is yours. Um, Bruce Coldham. Um, I think you all know me. I was there last time. I'm uh, following the committee uh, activity. I'm a retired architect. Um, I simply would like to know uh, when the owner's, pub the owner's project requirement document is formulated, uh, when, when in roughly in that process that was uh, uh, displayed earlier. So, so Bruce, are you asking specifically, like, is that Jan, is that February, is that March? No, I, actually, I'm assuming that it is done um, after the appointment of the owner's project uh, manager and before the uh, selection project of the architect. I assume that it is uh, um, is one of or contributes to the creation of the um, RFP. Um, for the project that is used as the basis for owner selection. I assume that's uh, the way it works or the order, um, but really, so therefore, I guess I'm asking whether that's true or not. Okay. Mike, Anthony. The RFS to uh, which will be used to solicit an OPM will be before the OPM is selected. It'll be uh, pretty much the, the first thing that this committee will publish after uh, after being invited into the feasibility study state. So basically it's the invitation to the feasibility study from MSBA. And then I, I think pretty much our first order of business will then be to issue the RFS for an OPM. The RFS, what's that? A request for services. Okay, it's for services. Um, the the owner's project requirements, I think, is a, sounds like it's a different document. I mean, it's the list of things that is important and which the building, um, presumably we're building a building, um, must perform. I, I guess from my point of view specifically, um, as you know, I think that daylighting um, is, a, is an important, uh, I think daylighting in the classrooms is an important component of this building. Um, 
And one of the ways in which we can achieve that clearly is to establish a, a daylight factor. And that I would expect or would hope would be put into the owner's project requirements that the owner would require certain uh, daylight performance, daylight factors in various spaces. So I want to make sure that uh, I know when that uh, is happening in the process so I can be uh, usefully supportive of uh, having that happen. Um, Jonathan, Dr. Morris, is an OPR part of the an MSBA process? I, I, I cannot speak. I'll let Mike talk about whether it's a formal part of it, but I would expect at some point we're going to have a list of criteria that that we would be, I think, directing to the architect more than the owner's project manager, but maybe it's at the owner's project manager stage that talks about things, for example, like the zero net energy bylaw in town um, and could include items like, like Bruce is bringing up. Um, but I'll defer to Mike as to when that, that would happen in the process. So I think, um, I think, oh, I'm sorry, Paul has his hand up. Kathy. So I just want to clarify, public comment is not a time for a conversation. How are we going to handle public comment? And at the council level, public comments are made. We don't go back and forth. Otherwise, it's like having multiple committee members. I think it's people should certainly raise questions and stuff. But um, if it's not on, I don't know. I just want to know how you want to handle this, Kathy. Yeah. No, I, I thought you were going to jump in on that, Paul. Um, um, so I think what we'll do, Bruce, is we'll get back to you. And um, we also have posted links to various MSBA documents and modules. And um, we can just get back to you with an answer on that. Um, that would be good. It's, a, it's a great question. And we'll just, we'll just, we'll provide it to the whole committee rather than take time now. Thank you. I don't see any other hands up. Um, so I think um, if there are any other issues anyone wants to raise, otherwise I think we're um, ending what we had planned to get through today. You know, as I noted at the very beginning, although I sort of race through it, uh, the website that we have on the town website now, all you do is the elementary school building committee. If you go up to where it says committees, it'll bring you down to our committee where everyone here is listed as a member. And then there is an agenda, there will be minutes and the packets to the extent we are um, have background materials that we're sending out or we're making available for the public. So that, like this list of milestones is now up and the, what we submitted on the building maintenance is up and stored there. So we'll be storing those. So if you don't wanna keep an email with all the attachments on it, you can go find them again. Um, and we'll be populating those as we get other information until we set up a project website. But right now it's a committee website. So I, th I think that's it, um, unless I, I'm looking around the faces. I wanna thank everyone for getting up early this morning and logging on in a timely way. And I wish you a very good Wednesday. The meeting is adjourned. <laughs>